Let's give a round of applause for Monica Martinez. Let me make sure I get my right and left right. So, there we go. That's me. That's the proud day that I got the PhD. That's the proud mom, sister, and aunt, because we all know when there's something good that happens, the entire family comes to, to, comes to the event. So that was my graduation from NYU, right down the street, um, when I received my PhD in a very nonlinear way years ago. I stand here today really as an anomaly, and David kind of gave the secret away. I'm an anomaly statistically. I am one of 50% of all Latinos who graduate from high school. I am one of 50% who did not go to community college. I am one of many Latino students who went to college immediately after high school. I'm one of many Latino students who went, who stayed in college after their freshman year, which was not an easy thing to do. And therefore, I earned the right to be, I earned the right to be part of the 13% of all Latinos in the United States who have a bachelor's degree. On top of that, I am part of 4% of all Latinos who have a graduate or professional degree. I am part of 2.9% of all Latinos who have a PhD. And I am 0.01% of all Mexican Americans who have a PhD. And sometimes I've seen that number be 0.001%, actually. So it just depends on which website you go to. I don't say this to be boastful at all. Half the time I forget I have a PhD. Somebody might refer to me as Dr. Martinez, and I forget they're talking to me. It's like this little pregnant pause for a second, and then this, all this pride kind of swells up in me. I say this to make the point that as Latinos, we have the least amount of educational attainment in the US. And that's unacceptable because you guys just heard all the numbers that we are the majority. We are the minority majority. And yet, we have the lowest educational attainment. Now, I'm a researcher, so I have to quote research. Research actually predicts that I will not go to college, right? The number one predictor of whether or not a student goes to college or anything else is based on their parents' educational attainment level. I'll back up. My mother is from Mexico. She came to the United States when she was 10 to Pueblo, Colorado with six other siblings. She got her high school degree, learned how to speak English, and pretty much raised her siblings as the oldest daughter in a Mexican-American family. She, had, she met my dad, who lived in Pueblo, Colorado. He's an American citizen, more, mostly from southern Colorado. He grew up in a single-parent household because his mother died early in his age, and his dad worked for the CFNI steel mill in Pueblo, Colorado, where many Latinos had migrated at that point, Mexican-Americans specifically. He finished high school, he went on to the military, he did a little bit of community college, uh, thanks to the GI Bill. He ultimately became a sheet metal worker, and then on top of that, he became the national director for the training programs for all the sheet metal workers' unions. But according to research, I therefore shouldn't have anything more than a high school diploma. However, it's very common for Latinos to have parents who didn't go to college. And in fact, in 2008, 40% of all Latino students' moms had not even finished high school. So we can't keep looking at that demographic as a deficit and as a predictor of the kind of educational attainment we'll receive. So I'm talking a little bit about another predictor that would have suggested I shouldn't be in college. So I went to Bear Creek High School outside of Lakewood, Colorado, in the burbs of Colorado. We moved there after fair housing, and my dad had gotten a promotion. And, you know, it was in Lakewood, Colorado, nice little suburb school, you know, middle class, some upper income uh, friends there. Parents were all, like, you know, in the medical field, the, the business professions, entrepreneurs, or working for the government, or telecommunications. I felt part of that norm. All my friends were going to go to college. Most of them went to the state universities. A few went to the community college. Uh, some of them went to private. Some went out of state. And I also just expected that I'd go to college as well. I thought I was just as smart as them, and they thought I was just as smart as them. And they actually even thought I was smarter, because I had a really good GPA. So that was blown, though, many years later when I realized what happened. This was my high school curriculum. The highest math class I ever took was Algebra II. The highest science class I ever took was basic chemistry, not even chemistry, when in reality you need three sciences to be accepted to college and to be ready for college. 
And then I probably knew more about the, how the West was won growing up in Colorado than I knew about the Civil War. So learning about the Civil War in college was a whole new thing. I'm like, I know about my frontier men. I know about my Native Americans. I don't really know about the Civil War. And then on top of that, I didn't really take any world history. I didn't uh, study a lot of the great books. I didn't go deep with Shakespeare, art, music, history, any of that. And lo and behold, look what's up there too. One and a half years of typing. I might have even had two years. I had a half year shorthand, which I absolutely hated. Nobody wants to see my handwriting. And I also had like a semester or so of auto mechanics. What the heck? Why not, right? Point is, that's really not a college-ready curriculum. And I didn't know that, and this is what I was in. Although I will argue, being able to type 70 words a minute did prepare me well for graduate school. So really, what happened? Well, I was the victim of the big, ugly, comprehensive American high school. What we don't know about the American high school usually in the United States, it's a very young institution, therefore it should be able to be changed. It was only founded in 1958, and it was founded when the Russians beat us to the moon in that whole great Sputnik era. So the leaders got really worried that we wouldn't have enough competitiveness globally if we didn't find other students who can ultimately go to college. So they thought they better start looking under rocks and start finding these smart kids, because otherwise the Russians are going to beat us. Sound a little familiar to what's going on right now with China and India and the focus on STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math? So James Conant, a Harvard graduate, created the American High School. And he created it for this very purpose. He believed there was only a finite amount of talent in this world. And the high school was designed to find that finite amount of talent. People don't know that. That is what our high school was founded on. It was not founded on these democracy and equalitarian things we talk about. It was founded as a means to find the finite talented. It was developed and designed specifically to have three tracks. Quote unquote from James Conant, one for the slow learners, one for the average learners, and one for the students who can go to college. So what track do we think I was in? I also suffered from what they then called the high school evolved into the shopping mall high school, and that was where you can just pick and choose your classes. And if you go back to my curriculum, come on, auto mechanics, I just wanted to learn how to change oil. You know, I thought it'd be a fun class. So I really did struggle with the kind of institution that we had. Now, if I look at research, I would have another reason why I wouldn't go on to college. It was one of the predictors of whether you go to college or not, is do you understand what it takes to go to college? Do you understand the admissions process? Do you understand the context of college? Do you understand the financial aid process? Absolutely not. I knew I was going to go to college. It was assumed. It was expected. And trust me, I was not going to tell my parents I wasn't going to college. I just thought, I'm going to college. And at the same time, I didn't know anything about the admissions process. But I went through the motions, which is really bizarre, right? I know I took the PSAT somewhere along the way because I got a bunch of brochures in the mail. I know I took the ACT, and I think I still remember the score, and I don't think I'll be bragging about it anytime soon. And I remember looking at the different view books that I got from the different you know, colleges, but I think I was just mimicking my friends, right? I didn't have anybody brokering that for me. And I remember I fell in love with Cornell because it was this bucolic campus, and it was snow, and it was in the, you know, in the rural areas, and I just thought it was so cool. And so I think I even started saying I was going to go to Cornell. Then I decided I wanted to go to UCLA because my cousins lived in, in LA and I really liked California. I even went to go visit UCLA. Yet, I didn't do anything. I didn't apply to any of those institutions. So when I look back at my passivity, I think, wow, was I really that ignorant? Was I really that naive? But in reality, that is commonplace for first-generation college students. The Lumina Foundation has this really great campaign ad called Know How to Go. It's targeted at Latinos and African Americans to teach them how to go to college, what I call college knowledge. When the communications group was doing the focus groups, they started interviewing different Latinos and African Americans, and these kids really did think that they were going to just magically go to college, much like I did. The other reason why I didn't do so well is I wasn't in a rigorous curriculum, so I didn't know how to study. I didn't have the right learning skills. I didn't know how to manage my time. I didn't know how to take notes. I didn't know how to use my peers as resources. I pretty much just didn't understand the college process in general. So you guys must be wondering how I did and where I went. Well, I went to Baylor University. What Mexican-American goes to a Baptist university in Waco, Texas? <laughs> this one. <laughs> Now, why did I go there? Oh, I know, because my brother did. Oh, why did I go there? Because my parents made me so my brother would take care of me. So pretty much that was my only choice. I did not apply to one other university, college, community college, or anything else. If I had not gone into Baylor, I don't know what I would have done. And you guys saw the curriculum I was in. I'm not really sure how I even got in, but I did. 
Now, how did I do once I got to Baylor? Well, I had pretty much straight A's, or you know, usually four A's and two B's. I think my first semester I had two F's, a D, and a C. If it wasn't that, it was two D's, one F, and a C. Second semester got a little better. I didn't get a single F. Just a couple D's and the rest were C's. This was really tragic for me, and especially for my parents, because their straight A kid was suddenly failing. And I didn't know what to do, and I was on academic probation. I didn't even know what that mean. It meant. I still have uh, memories of going into the dean's office. I'm not really sure what she wanted and what she told me, because I just blocked out the entire thing. But essentially, if, I, if, if, we, if our system would start looking at the predictors of success and design the system to help students like me, who come from a great family, who have loving parents, who by the grace of God from my parents, I end up going to college, then how else would I have gone? So we can laugh and we can cry or we can applaud my educational journey because I'm now one part of that 0.01%. But the fact is, it's not because of the system. And that's what I'm here to talk about today. So the system, and you've heard this a little bit from Maria and from Flavia, Flavio, is we are the majority minority. Currently in our school system, we have 11.72 Latino students in our elementary, middle, and high schools. That basically averages out to one out of five students in public education are Latino students. That's a really high percentage. Now, here's the tragedy of those numbers. Two-thirds of these students are in segregated schools. Over 50% of Latinos are in the highest poverty schools in the United States. And because of those two reasons, Latinos who are in these schools have teachers that have the least experience in teaching, and have the least um, advanced degree in this school. So we want, and, um, and on top of that, students still do not have access to a rigorous curriculum. On top of that, we wonder then why Latino students are two grade levels below white peers by age nine. Why there's a minority achievement gap in English and math that won't go away and has never gone away. Why we have 50% dropout rate. Why our kids go to community college. Why our kids drop out after their first year in college. Why our kids are less prepared for college than their white peers? Yet we're 11.2, and as Maria pointed out, we're the youngest population and the growing population, so this is only gonna grow. I'm gonna show you basically how that plays out. 100 students start as a freshman in high school. Basically 50 will graduate from high school, depending on what state or school or district you're in. Basically 30 will go straight on to college, 24 will stay after the freshman year, and maybe 12 or 19 will graduate from college. Out of 100 kids who started high school, 12 or 19 will finish college. Again, unacceptable. So I think my next slide is a video that maybe some of you guys saw this movie called Walkout a couple years ago. It came out about five years ago. It happened in 1968. And it was about four schools in East Los Angeles that had a high dropout rate, 60% of all Latino students. They weren't helping the students go to college. And it was predominantly Mexican-American schools. Well, the students realized that the school was getting money from the district for their attendance. So they said, what if you hurt the district where it counts most? We won't go to school, they don't get our money, let's walk out and let's have a conversation. Can't just sit around and wait for these pendejos. No, it's time no. to protest. Yeah. Yeah, hey, I know about the back from now, nah, makes a meme all the time. Uh, hey, ah. the point is non-violence, pendejos. for King and Gandhi and Stefan Chavez. You know Dr. King got everybody to boycott buses, right? Yeah, yeah. and since that is boycotting oh, great. Yeah, yeah, you guys, but this is about schools, okay? So let's boycott. The school. Yeah. Why not? That's completely different. No, it's not. It's, it's exactly the same. We get treated like second-class yeah, citizens. Right. Hey, you guys, you guys. Are you talking about buses here or what? Our schools are the back of the bus. Boycott the schools. Yes, boy. That's good. No, yeah. it's not a good idea. Oh, it isn't? No. You want to know why? Because they don't give a shit if these kids go to school or not. Actually, they do. Oh, oh right. professor, ADA, average daily attendance. I'm here to say today we are still at the back of the bus in public education. And we are the growing population, and it's unacceptable. And when will it be unacceptable to us? because it really now is our job to make it unacceptable. 
Why don't we deoccupy our schools versus occupy Wall Street? Let's deoccupy our schools as edu citizens. Let's claim our voice as learners and our rights and do what these kids did. Now, Maria showed a video where they did this in 2006, and they did use MySpace, and, they, and some of the kids start walking out of school again. The movie had just happened as well. But what if you used all the social media tools and everything that Flavia and Maria were talking about and really created this solidarity? But what are we gonna do? Because we can't keep crying victim if we don't own the problem ourselves, and we find these percentages unacceptable. We have great organizations right here in Bronx, in Los Angeles, a better community, who are advocating using community, organization, community organizing to change your schools. But maybe we need to step up that effort because basically the urgency is gonna outstrip what our leaders can do in these community organizations. And when as edu citizens do we start filling in those gaps that our political leaders are not filling in for us? Another possibility that we can do is we can basically appropriate the charter school movement for ourselves. You know, I'm not here to say break the system, but if the system's not working, why aren't we appropriating the charter school movement? So I don't know if a lot of you know that La Raza actually has a network of affiliated charter schools that were created from community demand in some of the Latino communities. And they were spearheaded by community leaders, and they were schools offered specifically for Latino students. In Hawaii, they've done that as well with the Native Hawaiians. There's a network of Native Hawaiian schools who said we want our schools to be um, cultural immersion, we want them to be able to speak Hawaiian in the schools, and they have a network of schools where they appropriate the charter school movement for such. Great example of a school is called the Ideas Schools. They're located in Rio Grande. They have eight to 10 campuses. Every single child is on the international baccalaureate curriculum, the hardest curriculum in the United States and internationally. Every single student by sixth grade enters a class called Road to College. It is staffed by a full-time college counselor, and they are taught how to go to college, and these full-time counselors work with the parents as well. This school was rated exemplary. All eight of these schools, as well as the organization, in the state of Texas, they received the highest rating you can get. Only 6% of other schools in Texas received that, and none of those schools serve the high-poverty, low-performing schools or kids that this school was serving. So it's time for us to really think about how we take back our schools and how we start believing these numbers are unacceptable and quit making it a small part of our conversation, but a large part. And the reason why is we all know our economy is changing. We've heard that we've talked about our economy needs to be globalization, and we have the networks in the globalization. But also, our new economy has to be one about entrepreneurism. We need to, create, we need to have students who are creators, entrepreneurs, problem solvers, critical thinkers. We have to have more of the STEM schools that President Obama is talking about, the science, technology, engineering, and math. So we need our students to have these kind of experiences because they should be leading the United States. We know that Latinos are resilient above all, are creative, are intellectual, bicultural, biliterate, hardworking, with a wonderful work ethic, but integrity at the very core, and as Maria pointed out, believes in the United States. How about if the U.S. would harness that energy, see us as resources, and let's stop sitting at the back of the bus? Thank you.